So today we will talk about sort of three big groups of methods and they deal with um, calculating the odds of something happening, then a whole bunch of questions related to groups, you know, predicting group membership, finding differences among groups or between groups, and then things dealing, they deal with time. And so I will be saying in all of those cases that technically you could answer those same questions with a simple correlations or regressions or just simply by looking at the data or plotting the data and looking the, uh, at the charts, at the, um, at the graphs. But the problem is that one, uh, as you remember, the regression analysis requires that your um, variables, especially the dependent variable, is a continuous normally distributed variable. And so when you deal with odd as the outcome, then obviously it's not a continuous normally distributed variable, so it wouldn't work. Likewise, if you have a group membership, uh, you know, like, will these people be employed or unemployed in one group versus the other? Again, it's not a normally distributed continuous variable. And so for this reason, the OLS regression or correlation will not work. It's just simply not suited for that method. And so you would need to use these other methods. Likewise, um, we always want to find a significant effect. So we want to find support for our hypothesis. And so because OLS regression or correlation analysis or ANOVA for that matter, they're not designed for this method. So the estimates will be less accurate. And less, ac less accurate means that they will be less um, significant. And so in some cases where your hypothesis is correct and the data actually would support it, if you use uh, OLS regression, not only it is wrong and the reviewers will probably not be happy with it, but even though you sort of can, can jam that variable into your model, it will likely not find the significant effect and uh, you know, your p-values will not be uh, you know, what you want them to be. And so as a result, your you basically will make a type two error. So you will fail to detect the effect uh, when it's present. And so for these reasons, it's important to use the appropriate method. And so uh, the challenge for today's class is obviously that um, each of these methods, they're not really that difficult or complicated per se. I mean, uh, for some of them like time series analysis, usually it would be a whole separate course. Like you would literally have a course on time series analysis, not just a lecture. But uh, in its basic form or their, in their basic form, I guess as long as you read the chapter and try for a few hours to play with the data, you will be able to produce the results, especially if you use Tabashnik and Fidel where you have you know, a copy or a sample of the res, res, you know, output uh, or results section. I guess you can just, you know, within one day, you can probably learn any of these methods to the point where you can use them as long as you know how, for example, regression works. So the point here is that to do it right, we probably would need like a full whole lecture on each method uh, with a good homework where you try things where maybe, you know, do some exercises in class. And obviously in this class, we cannot do it. So my goal here is not to explain to you or teach you how to use uh, time series analysis or uh, latent in class analysis, but rather explain to you why in some cases regression is not enough and then also tell you that there is a different method available, why it is better so that you remember that, or at least you know that there is a technique and you know why we need it. And then when you need to do it either for your dissertation or for, or for an upcoming paper, you will remember, oh, I remember, yeah, there was a logic, log logistic regression, not a regular regression. So I remember something about that. And then you go to the book, you just read a chapter and like, oh yeah, okay, now I understand. So it's more kind of to tell you what's available and why it's necessary rather than you know, teach you how to use it in every possible sort of you know, nuance. But again, it's not really that difficult. And for each of these methods, there is a chapter in uh, Tabashnik and Fidel, it's only one chapter. So I suppose it's you know, comprehensible as long as you know the basics like regression analysis, correlation analysis. I think you shouldn't need more than a day or two to familiarize yourself enough with the other methods to use them. Uh, maybe a little bit more if really like if you need it for dissertation and you need really a sophisticated method. So, uh, but yeah, we will talk about those sort of different options why they need it. Uh, what purpose they serve, and then a link to where you can learn more. And so I'll start with, let me just go in the presentation mode here. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so what we'll do here is we'll go method by method. I'll give you some information, but then each time I will have a question for you. Can you think of a research question that would be suitable for this method? Or that this method would be the appropriate method to answer? based on the context of your study. Like some of you are looking, for example, at the effects of culture on uh, you know, team membership and survival. 
Uh, others are looking at job satisfaction. Others are looking at the stock market valuation or valuation of your company on the stock market. So basically, each time we're talking about the method, uh, please think, how can I twist my research question or how can I change the angle from which I approach my study so that I can use this method? And for your homework analysis, I mean, for, for your homework assignment, you would need to choose one of these methods and basically write a study proposal in the context of your prior, you know, studies for, for, for one of these methods. Again, this time I will not be requiring many details as far as how exactly would be tested because we will not be covering that in class. But I want to see a question, research question and a set of hypotheses that would be appropriate for this particular method or that this method would be appropriate to address or test those hypotheses. So I wanna see that you recognize, okay, if I wanna test this, OLS regression is not enough or ANOVA is not enough. I need to use this and here is why. So after each of the methods that we review today, the question will be, can you give me an example of your own study that would be uh, sort of appropriate in this context? And so we're going to start with the logistic regression. So it also appears in literature under, un, uh, under the name uh, Logit, and there are different sort of methods of estimation. There is also something called Probit. They provide very similar results. They just use different methods to arrive on the, uh, on the you know, to, to the estimates. But uh, as far as the printout, they look very similar and they use very similar commands. And like Ms. Pia says, they will go together, Logit, Probit, in Stata, they will go together. And to be honest, most people don't even know what the difference is. It's almost like, uh, factor analysis versus principal component analysis. I mean, there are little, you know, re reasons why you use one versus the other. And, uh, you know, if you read the chapter, you will know, but in reality, the results will be almost identical each time. So they use slightly different sort of equations, but um, come to the same conclusion. And so briefly speaking, the logistic regression is a method. It's, it's almost like OLS regression, almost identical, but for the outcomes that are um, sort of binary odds, so what are the odds of A happening versus B happening? Of people, person getting a job or not getting a job? Uh, of person voting a Republican or Democrat? So uh, it doesn't have to be only two outcomes, it can be multiple groups, but it's not a normally distributed variable. It's an odd, basically odds of being in a group. And so here I have a few examples. Let's say, for example, um, uh, you wanna know who becomes a leader. And so the column in your data set is basically uh, leadership status. So some people have one, so they are a leader and others have a zero, not a leader. Or maybe some people have one formal leader, two informal leader and three a follower. And so that's your dependent variable. You cannot use regression analysis because uh, it requires a continuous normally distributed variable. And here you have basically a binary or some sort of a you know, nominal uh, category variable. And so in this case, logistic regression would be a suitable uh, method. Uh, so likewise, for example, um, uh, in the first question, we are trying to predict leadership, but in the second, we are trying to predict the role of the person on the team. Again, it could be maybe uh, the team leader, but also maybe the team secretary, maybe the role of the team's, I don't know, devil's advocate, and so on. And so you have the person's, everybody's age, gender, work experience, IQ, CQ, and whatever. And so can you predict what role this person will be performing on the team? based on these characteristics. And so uh, just like regression, but you know, with a different type of outcome variable. Uh, so, and as I said, um, um, uh, you know, let's say for example, at the end of the project, there will be three levels of bonuses for the best performance performers. You know, like maybe, you know, uh, somebody will get the first prize. Uh, what was that uh, movie, Glenn Berry, Glenn Beck, or Glenn Mary, Glenn Beck, you know, the old one. And so he was saying, you know, the first prize is Cadillac, the second prize is the set of knives, and the third prize you are fired or something like that. So you kind of have best, medium, worst, but they're not a continuously normally, continuous normally distributed variable. So you just have three outcomes. And so you're trying to predict who's gonna be in which category uh, based, let's say, for example, on age, gender, work experience, IQ, and so on and so on. So those would be the questions. And um, so, as I said, it will be very, very similar to um, OLS, not OLA, uh, OLS regression. Um, the output even looks very similar. And if you use SPSS or R or um, Stata, it looks exactly the same. The only difference is that you change the command. Like in Stata, instead of uh, writing regression, you would write logic. But then you put the dependent variable in dependent variables. Same stuff with the only difference that your outcome is yes or no, or the odds of 
yes versus no, or the odds of uh, winning or not winning, get in a job or not get in a job, get in the bonus or not get in the bonus, getting into the college or not getting into the college, graduating or not graduating. So, so basically, if you look at the data, uh, you, you kind of, for your outcome, you have either zero or one. For example, you know, graduate, not graduate. And so your data will be then distributed essentially in two groups here. And so you can have a predictor. So maybe on this uh, axis, you have number of hours the person put in the job. And so, you know, if the person put a lot of hours in, the person is more likely to be one. And if a uh, few hours in, the person is more like, less likely to graduate. And technically, OLS regression will give you the slope and will say, you know, the more hours you put in, the more likely you have one as the outcome instead of zero. So the software doesn't know if it's a normally distributed variable or not. But that can produce not only, you know, wrong estimates, but sometimes it can say, you know, if you have so many hours, then your chances of getting the bonus will be 250%, which is impossible because the most is, is 100% or one or zero. So logistic regression kind of uses a different set of formulas and it estimates this kind of curve. So it never goes below zero and never goes be, uh, above one but the rest is almost identical. There is one important, so here are the exact formulas if you wanna look at it, but there is one important, um, very important difference and that is, yeah, so the output looks almost the same. So this one is from, uh, from SPSS, uh, you know, looks like you have the same betas, standard errors, and then you can generate all kinds of additional statistics like significance, like maybe 95% uh, confidence interval, whatever else. But the difference is very much, uh, the big difference is the interpretation of the beta coefficients. So in the OLS regression, as you know, the beta coefficients, anyone can tell me what they mean? Like, let's say you, for example, are trying to predict uh, if your uh, education is correlated uh, with income. And so your education is in years of education and your income is in thousands of dollars per year. And then your coefficient is, let's say, for example, 0.3, so 0.3. What exactly does that 0 0.3 mean? Can anyone tell me? In the OLS regression. So your beta for um, education is 0 0.3 when your outcome variable is uh, income in thousands of dollars per year. So what exactly that 0 0.3 means? For every additional year of education, you get $300. Exactly. For every additional year of education, you get 0 0.3 units so for every unit of change in X, you get so many units of change in Y. What if this is not B, an unstandardized coefficient, but a standardized coefficient? So if it's beta standardized coefficient, what would that mean? You get 0 0.3, but it's a standardized 0 0.3. So what, what would that be, the interpretation of that number? Anyone? So instead of one unit change in X leads to so many unit changes in B, it means what? Uh, Susan, I think you're saying something, but your, uh, your microphone is muted. Sorry, a percentage change? Not percentage, standard deviation change. So oh, for standard. every standard deviation change in education level, whatever the standard deviation in your sample is, you will see 0.3 standard deviation change in income. Again, whatever that is. Let's say if your average years of education is let's say 15 years with a standard deviation of two. So that means that for every standard deviation for every additional two years, and then let's say your income level is let's say $50,000 with a standard deviation of 20,000. So that means, you know, you would get so many. So here it's almost the same, but the difference is you have odds. So you have probability instead of uh, unit change. So it would be basically for every additional year of education, the probability of getting the job is increasing and it's by so many percent. So it's percentages. Or if it's standardized then for every standard deviation change in X, the probability of Y being one as opposed to zero is so many more percent higher or lower if it's a negative uh, coefficient. So here you're talking about in terms of probabilities or odds of one versus zero, for example, or if you have uh, you know, like Republican, Democrats, independent outcome. So in that case, it would be one versus another percentage versus the third one. But um, uh, the rest is exactly the same. So, and here I even found um, a real homework when I took this course, it was statistics 711 when I took it for knows how many years. So this is actually from my like real homework that I copied and pasted. So we did, um, uh, it, the question was, does mother's education increase probability of the child graduating high school? And so mother's education was in years of education. And uh, so 
the, the, the interpretation, so the coefficient, the beta coefficient was 1.24. So it was bigger, you know, greater than one. So that means that holding other variables constant, every year increase in mother's education increases the odds of graduating from high school compared to not graduating from high school by 24.2%. So basically, more than, like if it were exactly one, it would mean that it doesn't change. If it were less, then it, you know, reduces by so many percent. In this case, it increases by 24.2%. So the rest is exactly the same. You can just like in OLS regression, you can add control variables, like controlling for, you know, maybe, I don't know, um, husband's income, I mean, uh, education level, maybe family size, maybe number of kids. You can also have the same uh, method for uh, testing moderator or mediator effects, but the coefficients in this case would be the percent change uh, as opposed to uh, unit change or standard deviation change. So, and then one interesting twist here is that uh, normally at logistic regression, it's odds of one versus zero, getting or not getting the job, graduating or not graduating. But sometimes you can have a situation where you have so-called ordinal uh, case. So where you have low, medium, high, for example, not normally distributed, but there is a clear little more most, or you can have nominal. So where you have like for example, uh, you know, um, using the same example with mother's education. So for the ordinal uh, uh, logistic regression, it would be not just graduating high school, yes or no, but for example, getting a high school diploma versus getting a college degree versus getting a graduate degree. So you have sort of ordinal outcome variable and it will give you a little bit more coefficients here, like similar like what you would see with the dummy variable. And it will give you the odds of this versus that increase by so much. And then if you have nominal um, uh, outcomes, like for example, let's say, does mother's education predict what major the kid will choose? You know, become an engineer versus doctor versus lawyer versus other. And so same thing, but in this case, it's not low, medium, high, it's just, you know, A option or option A, option B, option C. And so in this case, it's the same thing. It just will give you a little bit more coefficients but it will predict that, you know, odds of uh, certain outcomes. In theory, you can have quite a few of those outcomes, uh, especially if it's ordinal, I guess you can have quite a few, but once you have more than five, I guess you can count that as a continuous variable and you can just use regular regression. So it would be simpler that way, but that's the idea, you know, briefly. And same thing here, you can technically use uh, ANOVA if you want, but ANOVA will give you more as kind of unit change as opposed to uh, logistic regression odds of being in one versus another. So it just gives you the odds instead of uh, unit or standard deviation changes. So now thinking about that, can you think of a uh, study question uh, in the context of whatever you study uh, so that it would be more appropriate to address that question, to answer that question with the logistic regression rather than OLS regression? Last semester, I did one where it was odds of the film um, being released in the theater versus streaming. Um, because of COVID, um, I looked at um, whether or not like prior data would be like, well, the company's going to do on their streaming service, or they're going to wait for it to go in the theaters. I'm really glad that the day I submitted it to Aaron's class because uh, the next day HBO was like, oh, we're going to release everything to HBO Max and uh, and the theater at the same time. So that would have messed up everything. But at the time, it worked well for me. So Perfect. That, that's a perfect example. So if you wanted to predict, for example, the movie uh, that the box office, right? So you would have essentially anywhere from failing and making zero dollars to making, you know, two billion dollars. And in that case, it probably, let's say you're trying to predict the box office based on, let's say, for example, the movie budget, the, the name of the main actor, uh, or, you know, maybe the, the, the um, pay the main actor got, maybe, I don't know, um, um, I don't know how much the, the producer made on the last movie and whatever other I, thing. Yeah, I used, um, for, for the class, I, I had more data for it, but the, for the class, I just used box, uh, Sorry, um, the um, the budget for it and uh, the hype for the film as yeah. a, as a moderator, um, you know. But yeah, yeah it, I, I had like at lead actors gross and all the, all of that information as well. Yeah. But 
Yeah. yeah. And, and there could be all kinds of other predictors, how many movies the main, you know, producer made before or, you know, or what studio is making it. But yes, so, so if you wanted to predict the box office, then OLS regression makes more sense. But if you wanted to predict if they're going to release it to the movie theaters or to streaming, that's basically odds of one versus the other. And then obviously logistic regression makes much more sense. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Any other examples? What about the uh, standard deviation of a CEO salary to either uh, interlocking board or a um, board diversity? That's a very good one. Yeah, exactly. So you basically have different board memberships so, or odds of one type versus the other. Exactly. That's a very, very good one. Or, you know, being, for example, elected or appointed to the board of directors or not. So again, yes or no. So uh, again, it could be all kinds of different uh, predictors, you know, CEO salary, maybe company size, you can have all kinds of moderators, mediators, but ultimately the outcome is, will, will this person or does this contribute to the person's uh, appointment to the board or appointment to a different kind of board or the company having a different kind of board. And I think that's what you mean, right? So uh, depending on the company structure, will they have this kind of a board or a composition? Right. Like that? And as long as you code it, you know, like one corresponds to interlocked kind, two corresponds to whatever the other kinds are, then yeah, that's a very, very good one. And if that's the outcome or less regression wouldn't work, you would need to use logic. Yep, very good. So let's move on then. We have a few more methods to cover. Uh, so next one is survival analysis. This one is fascinating. So you kind of can do it again, uh, the same questions you probably could answer in a way with uh, OLS regression, but survival analysis is a specific instant when your dependent variable is uh, basically, is this person still, let's call it alive or not? Originally, it was a, a series of methods developed in biology and they studied uh, survivals of, uh, survival of bacteria and then I suppose other plants or animals. But uh, you know, just like we are trying to predict if the bacterium will, would survive under different conditions, uh, you could equally use the same method to predict if the company will stay in business, if the employee will stay employed or drop out or will be fired. And so the method is exactly the same even though it's a different sort of you know, uh, type of subject. And so the questions could be, let's say you know why some people are, free, you wanna know why some people are free, freeloaders, or, you know, free riders. So some people, you know, are team members, but are not doing anything. And so let's say, for example, you're observing a hundred people working in 20 teams and some of those team members are so bad that the teams kick them out. Like basically they say, no, this person is a bona fide freeloader. We don't want this person on the team and they kick the person out of the team. And so you're trying to predict who's going to be the freeloader based on age, gender, work experience, IQ, CQ, and let's say you even want to predict, you know, how soon it will happen. Like, you know, do any of those predict who's going to be the free rider and then maybe will it be right away in week one, two, three, four, five of the project and so on. Or you know that many companies, startups do not uh, survive the first year. And in fact, uh, statistics show that like 80% of the companies fail within the first year. And so you're trying to predict what explains or what, uh, what predicts uh, the survival rate. And so you're trying to see if the age, gender, work experience, IQ, or other characteristics of the company founder, if they predict if the startup will survive or not. And so in this case, you technically, again, could use like one or two uh, for, uh, you know, um, survives or doesn't be beyond one year. But what if you have data, let's say week by week or month by month, and you want to know how soon they will sort of, you know, go bankrupt. Or, or how long they will survive. So you want to get a more fine-grained picture. So it's not only survive or not within a year, but you want to look at sort of, you know, more fine-grained picture over time. And you want to see if companies drop out from that sample at which rate and what predicts how fast they, they drop out. So in this case, the survival analysis uh, would be the appropriate technique. So basically same, similar to, to regression in a, in a general sense, but you specifically want to predict survival or, you know, change in membership or dropping out from the sample. So, um, so um, uh, here you would have, again, you know, many more different interesting, you know, richer results than you would get from, from, from the traditional methods. Like, for example, what if the survival rate, um, um, what, what is the survival rate of your businesses or people at various points in time? So let's say you have 50 different points or you track those data, as I said, week by week over years. And so you want to know what percent of the employees will last at least three months or maybe five months. 
I guess you can use the percentage, but again, the question would be what predicts it? Uh, you know, what are the predictors? What are the correlates uh, controlling for this moderator mediators and stuff like that? Um, other survival uh, differences in survival rates among different groups. So again, it could be men versus women, or maybe, I don't know, local versus immigrant employees, or maybe employees who had an onboarding program before they started the job versus those who didn't have that training. So did that program help? And so you wanna see if after the onboarding program or whatever orientation program, if the people stay in the job longer. And so you wanna see how that changes over time. And so uh, here the data look a little bit different than in, in OLS regression. So here in the data, like in the traditional case, you have so-called uh, live tables or survival tables where you basically for each time period, and again, you can have many, many of those time periods, you sort of have uh, one if the person is still in the data set, zero if the person dropped out or died. And you kind of have the, you know, what percentage of the people with each characteristic uh, are still available in that Petri dish, so to speak, um, uh, at any given point of time. And so you can then uh, use sort of they survived as, uh, uh, not, not they survived, so you can use that one or zero as your sort of dependent variable, so to speak. Uh, again, you could probably use OLS regression and you could use, let's say, days survived or days until fired or days until the person quits. And you can do the OLS regression, but OLS regression will give you a much, much um, sort of less rich picture. Like for example, um, in survival analysis, um, the, the uh, statistics methods that you use will generate charts that looks sort of like this. So you would have like a survival analysis for each group, you know, over time. It will give you the significance in, diff, you know, are there, is there a significant difference between the groups in terms of the survival? Uh, in this particular case, we've plotted only male and female, but in the analysis, it will try to explain why there is a difference. Is it the difference in education level? Is it a difference in, I don't know, effort? So it gives you a much, much richer picture. And so basically, again, not that different from regression analysis, but the difference is that your dependent variable is not a normally distributed variable like income or, or education level or whatever it is. But it's basically, is the person still in the sample or not? And you look at it over time. So, and we'll talk about the time series analysis that again relates to this one. I probably should have put it now here. I'll do it at the end, but uh, it's sort of more closely related to survival analysis. In fact, you know what, let me do time series analysis. Just give me one second. I, I should move it closer. I, I don't know why I separated them in time, but um, it makes more sense to put them together because both of them deal with uh, time. So I'm not sure why, uh, so just one second. Okay. So um, when we go to time series analysis, uh, same thing, but here you're looking specifically at the change. So it's not survival zero or one, so still in the sample or not, but you wanna look at a specific characteristic over time, uh, income over time, performance over time, number of conflicts over time, and so it's a family of methods uh, here. It's not just one technique. It's, you know, like all kinds of different things that you can do within this method uh, or family of methods. But every time you're looking at change over time. And so specifically time series analysis is used when you have some, some textbooks say that you have more than 10 time, time data points, T1, T10. Others say that once you have 50 or more, you want to use time series analysis. But the point is that you have a lot of repetition. So your data, you know, measure again and again and again and again, whatever you measure. And you want to then track those things over time and see if there is an improvement or, or decline over time. Uh, if there is a difference between different groups, if there is a difference, you know, uh, between different people. So like, for example, does productivity change over the employee tenure at the company? Are there changes in productivity over time for women versus men? So those kinds of things. And so uh, again, technically you could probably plot the data on the chart and look if there is a change, you know, growth or decline. But importantly, you wanna know what predicts the change. And so that's where, uh, you know, you couldn't just look at the graph, two dimensional graph and look at all predictors. So the time series analysis will allow you to look at multiple predictors while controlling for all kinds of variables. So it gives you a significant uh, testing, you know. So yes, you see on the chart that the line goes up, but is it a significant improvement or not? So here you will test, uh, you know, what are the chances that you are wrong if you are uh, saying that there is a chance, I mean change, or same thing, uh, you see that there are two different lines for group A versus group B, but is it a significant change? Could it be just by chance? So then um, the p-values here will give you sort of the probability if you've been making the type one error. 
And so, um, again, it will give you very nice plots, um, um, similar to the one that I showed here, but it would be here you have the survival. So basically you have percent of people still in the group, whereas, whereas for the time series analysis, the dependent variable will be something else, like income level, or as I said, number of conflicts, or number of complaints, or maybe the stock price. And so you're trying to predict it and specifically track it over time. So very similar in that respect, just more complicated, you know, you can deal with uh, more than just zero one for the dependent variable. Uh, so, yeah. And one interesting thing here, just something we talked about data, and I think I may have mentioned it, but that again goes back to what your data file looks like. So when you have all these repeated measures, uh, you have uh, two options to structure your data. You can have so-called uh, white data set or long data set. And so here you have a long data set. So uh, in this case, it's subjects, but it could be time periods. So it would be, you know, uh, these are the, you know, uh, characteristics or results at time one. This is at time two, this is at time three, and then all the way to, you know, day 1000. But you can structure the data set the same way, but wide. So you would have your subjects, but then, you know, these are the characteristics at day one. Maybe, I don't know, number of products they produce per day. This is day two, this is day, day three, and so on and so on. So you can put those time periods, T1, T3, you know, wide, or you can put them long. And so it's always a contentious issue, which one is more readable, which one is more convenient. The good news is that most software packages allow you to automatically reshape the data. Like in Stata, it's reshape long, reshape wide. Like literally, you can just, you know, change it there. It will automatically sort of flip the data set 90 degrees. Uh, so uh, you can do it manually as well if needed uh, in Excel, for example, but if it's a big file, it would be hard to do it manually. So you want to use those formats. But the point is, yes, when you have multiple measures over time, you sort of can structure the data to different ways. All right, so let's again go back to your studies. So how can you add the time dimension to your study? And so what would be the examples of your, um, you know, possible research questions that you would answer in the context of the study? where the question is, is something changing over time, either changing or, or surviving? I'll, I'll give you one more example, but you know, that probably applies to all of you, but you can think of more like, for example, let's say you wanna predict performance, right? And so you wanna predict uh, in terms of time series analysis. So you wanna see if performance is predicted by IQ, by CQ, by, education level by tenure at the company and whatnot, right? But the complication becomes if it's not a one-time measure, it's not like just performance at a given time, but you have performance every week for the last 10 years. And so you wanna see, for example, let's say if education level or a CQ correlates with performance, but not just in a given time, but over time. So maybe it matters in the first year, but doesn't matter down the road, or maybe it doesn't matter the first year, but then it matters more or maybe it matters for men, but doesn't matter for women. So once you have this kind of longitudinal data, that's where you wanna use your time series analysis because uh, you know, a one-time measure wouldn't work. I guess you can take the overall average performance, you know, just take the average across the entire 10 years, or maybe use the last final data period and you wanna predict if it predicts performance as of yesterday. But if you wanna look at this change in performance over time, you would need to use time series analysis because OLS will not be sufficient. So any, any other interesting questions? So, uh, so one of the things I'm looking at is how work at home has influenced the flexibility stigma. Mm -hmm. And so that could be something that if I could cap capture that data, because there were people working at home before, right? Yep. And there will be, again, that, that maybe I could look at uh, the, the duration of time and how, um, how much time it was that led to the does that make sense? It makes sense. So if you want to see if there was a difference before COVID and after COVID, you effectively have only two data points. That's in, two, right? Yeah. In, but in I case, I don't think you would need the time series analysis. You can just literally look at, uh, you know, before and after ANOVA, sort of. But let's right. say, for example, you want to see if uh, working from home versus working um, uh, from the office affects satisfaction or affects uh, the relationship with the people. And let's say you have an app on the phone and you ask people once per day to report how happy they are or how motivated they are. And you track it for the whole year and you have daily data. And so you wanna see how that changes over time, but you have 
you know, repeated measure every single day. In that case, yes, OLS regression is not just before and after. It's, you know, over 365 days every day. That's where you would get into this if, if you had those kinds of data. But if I wanted to see if the, the, the flex, if, if flexibility stigma was impacted by people working at home longer than if I captured that data, if that was my, you know, if I wondered, maybe it's not just, you know, in COVID, but that, if that it's a matter work. of people working, I mean, I'd have to, you know, start it, get it going, but I mean. That, that could work, but again, importantly, if the question is dependent on how many days they worked, I guess you can just add one variable, the, the number of days. But if you have something measured every single day, that's where it gets a little, like for example, let's say you wanted to see if productivity changes depending on whether or not people work from home versus from work. And so mm -hmm. you measure productivity, let's say you have um, some people who could do some sort of sales calls, right? And you wanna know how many units of product they sell per day. So you have those daily data. And so you track it over two years, for example. And so if it was just simply a one kind of one snapshot, uh, you know, on, on such a date, you could just simply compare the averages for the two groups. Do people on January the 1st sold more uh, units of product when working from home versus those working from the office? But if you have many, many days of sales data and you wanna know if there is a difference between the two groups, and especially if you suspect that maybe, you know, in the first few months there was no difference, but then over time those working from home got stigmatized or got lazy or maybe slept too long or maybe were distracted by the kids or, you know, so that change may change over time and you have those measures for every single day, that's where you would need time series analysis, for example, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. How about for survival analysis? Can you think of anything where, you know... Um, uh, so, so I, yeah. so I have a, uh, kind of a real life example, of, I think it would fit survival. For my company, we have a, a huge turnover problem. We, we do medical scribing, we hire mostly um, students who are trying to get into med school or who have just gotten into med school. So our turnover is like 75% um, within like two months. So it's, oh. it's pretty crazy, but we want to be able to predict. We want to be able to know what types of people coming into our training, into our program, make it who survive. Right. And then maybe we go on hiring more of those people. So I might have to try that out and see. That's very good. And I think also Lance, if I remember correctly, you were doing some medical stuff, right? And so, uh, uh, I am. Um, I don't know. I'm. I, I don't know that I'm doing anything on um, survival. Uh, most of my patients survive. I mean, uh, some of them don't. <laughs> yeah, but but in, in um, that case, it doesn't have to be survival per se. Let's say, for example, you want to know if the doctor is going to be sued. You know, like you know, uh, a big issue. Sometimes doctors do have you know legal you know issues, and so. <laughs> You, you can look day by day. So, you know, you have a thousand doctors in your sample. On day one, nobody had a lawsuit. On day two, nobody had a lawsuit. On day 225, one of the doctors was sued. And then on yeah. day 365, another doctor was sued. And so after 10 years, 8% or 10% of those, do do those doctors, uh, you know, have been sued by the. And so in this case, basically zero would be, or one would be the doctor has yet another day successful, no, no incident, so to speak, you know. Versus, yeah, I think, well, one of the things we're trying to look at, and, and we're actually working on a, we're getting a study rolling up on this right now, is we're trying to predict which of our students will fail out, yeah. which will, or, or, yeah, yeah. And, and, and we're trying to get a better prediction of who will ultimately complete the program and then subsequently pass the end, pass the board exam. So if they complete the program, but they don't pass the board exam, then none of it really matters. That's, so. that's yeah, that's a perfect example, exactly. But as I said, it doesn't have to be survival you know, per se, it could be any change in status. So, uh, you know, should or not should, uh, uh, maybe, I don't know, got a bonus or didn't get a bonus, uh, was poached by another company or not, was promoted or not. And so, you know, like for example, promotion, what predicts promotion? So on day one, everybody started where they, you know, uh, where they were on, you know, at the beginning. Day two, everybody's still in their position. By day maybe 25, somebody got promoted. By day 50, maybe, you know, 10 people were promoted. And so the question is, who gets promoted? Are they, again, educated, uh, education level, gender, age, uh, I don't know, uh, all kinds of other things, uh, you know, some sort of familial uh, relationship to the CEO and things like that. 
if people want to get a study, there's in Greensboro, there's a BB&T, which has a new name, and they were acquired by somebody, SunTrust or something. Sure they have a call center. Oh, sure they've is. got a call center, and they allow a lot of PhD students, they actually, they come to UNC, Chapel Hill, they go to other schools, and they say that they really struggled in the Greensboro area to find students that want to study their call center. You could do a call center study to see which customers drop before a CSR by time series. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's a very good example. I actually have an account with BBNT, so yeah. So Which is now truest. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking too about program and how do you predict people um, sticking through. And I think a lot of times I can see evidence that if you allow people to um, join a program late, mm -hmm. they really don't stick with it. So you make all these exceptions for people yeah, that it, quickly kind of wash out. So I think that, that might be a, a good study to take a yeah, look at. Yeah, for culture, that's a good one. And again, importantly, if we just want to know graduated or didn't graduate, logistic regression probably would be better, just zero one. But if you want to know how soon graduated, or I mean, how soon dropped out, so, you know, did that person drop out in semester one or did that person last, you know, until the last semester? Then, yeah, then you want to have survival analysis. And that's a very good question. It seems like in your program, pretty much everybody's still in, right? I think there was somebody, one student, I think we lost, but everybody's still in, so remarkable. But yes, if we wanted to know, you know, if one of the sort of criteria of success is the person graduates uh, or doesn't drop out. And so we want to know who drops out, why, and importantly, how quickly, how soon then yeah, that would be a very suitable method. All right, very good, so very good. So let me go back to uh, my screen. So um, now let's talk about a series of uh, methods for, they all deal with group membership in one way or another. And so we have here cluster analysis, discriminant analysis, uh, latent class analysis, and there are several more in this, you know, I'll just give you some examples. In fact, cluster analysis and latent class analysis are very similar. Uh, they use different math, but the purpose is very similar. It just one allows for a dependent variable and the other one doesn't. But essentially you're trying to either uh, find uh, without any a priori hypothesis, how many distinct types of objects exist. And by types of objects, I mean, it could be you know, uh, segments of customers or types of students. Uh, you can also try to predict uh, who are the people who belong to these different groups. And I'll give you examples. Uh, or if you want to split, uh, you know, people into different groups, you know, what are the similarities and what characteristics should you use to split them in a way that within the group they're very similar, but between the groups they're very different. And so here you can look like cluster analysis very used, uh, very often used in, in marketing. So you're trying to sort of um, uh, discern or, or, you know, describe the segments of your customers, you know, what are the characteristics of the different types of customers and I'll give you a few examples in a minute or what are the different types of employees and what are the characteristics of each type? Again, based on, for example, performance uh, or based on, uh, I don't know, retention. Or what are the common characteristics among the people of uh, different pro professions? And so a good example here would be, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll go to this one, um, cluster analysis and uh, letting class analysis would be marketing. And let's say we are talking about cars, right? So let's say you're trying, you were hired uh, to, to develop a strategy for selling cars and you realize that you need to tailor your message to different uh, customers, but you're not sure who the different customers are, basically what are the different types. And so you're trying to kind of group your thousands, millions of customers into some kind of customer personas, you know, like uh, different uh, sort of, you know, types, clusters. And so you're not sure what they could be. And so you're thinking, you know, who would be those customers? Well, I have all kinds of information on my customers. I know, for example, their age and gender and income and education level. I know what profession they have. I know if they're married or not. I know how many kids they have. I know what kind of hobbies they have. But how do I group them? And so you would run then cluster analysis or latent class analysis, and it will give you sort of, it will repeat the analysis many times. It uses maximum likelihood. And uh, in fact, latent class analysis could run literally like for half a day on a regular computer if you have more data. But then in the end, it will say, okay, these people are in this cluster and these are the characteristics. And these people are in this cluster and these are the characteristics. And so it will sort of describe how they're different. And so if it were with cars, you know, you could get something that would be like one class cluster, you would label it, let's say soccer mom. So maybe married, uh, has kids, uh, maybe unemployed at this time, maybe relatively young, and uh, tends to buy a minivan, for example. 
and then weekend warrior uh, so or whatever label you will give so those would be the people let's say primarily male uh, maybe you know like adventurous sports uh, work in a uh, well-paid position uh, have high education and how income level and so maybe they're more likely to buy I don't know SUVs or like Jeep Wrangler and so that's that's the type of you know and then you know show off I don't know maybe they buy some sort of um, cabrio uh, you know some some roadsters and so maybe their you know characteristics are I don't know midlife crisis age uh, high income uh, I don't know marital problems and whatever other things and so they tend to I'm, I'm being here as stereotypical as possible but you know obviously it can be something completely different uh, efficient guy so like myself always buys a Japanese uh, sort of vanilla but reliable and plain car preferably station wagon because you can put, put more things in it or maybe contractor so so it doesn't matter it, what I mean is that each time the classes obviously could be different but it will give you it will separate it into groups that are as different as possible from one another, but the people within the group as similar as possible. And in that case, when you place your, when you target your advertisement, you will then, you know, uh, maybe advertise the efficiency and, uh, and price to people with characteristics of the efficiency guy or soccer mom. But then maybe you would um, uh, focus on the message of, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe adventure and uh, vitality or whatever, for the weekend warriors. So for people who are richer and maybe, you know, certain age and certain income level, you will send them a different message. And so you want to know who those uh, people are so that you can target message and tailor it. So it's not one size fits all. Um, so here you can predict, oh, sorry, yeah. And then discriminant analysis, it's almost the same thing, but it's almost the opposite. So in this case, you know the groups, like for example, you look at what they bought so you know who bought the uh, SUVs and who bought the uh, electric vehicles and who bought the pickups and who bought the minivans. But you're trying to understand are there any differences among those groups? Are they different in terms of age? Are they different in terms of income level? And for this one, I suppose you could just basically get the average, uh, you know, median there. I mean, average just for each variable for each group. So you would have minivan group, average age, such and such, average income level, such and such, average, uh, I don't know, education level, such and such. But then the question becomes, so is it significantly different? And then if you have multiple groups, you wanna know a little bit more about them. So in that respect, it's kind of similar to ANOVA, but it looks at multiple um, variables and it specifically tries to see if the two groups are significantly different on multiple dimensions. So for ANOVA, it was primarily on one or maybe with a few controls. Here you look, it can literally be like 50 different characteristics and you're trying to see if there is any difference. But it's all about that group membership. And so what's interesting about these methods, <clears throat> they have all kinds of statistics uh, that you can use to sort of test how good the model is. Let's say you, you predict that, you know, when it comes to cars, you predict that maybe age, education level, um, and income level can explain what kind of car the person will buy. And you use all these tests, but then instead of the R squared, you know, where you have so much variance is explained by these three variables, here it tells you what percent of people you can correctly place in their respective groups based on these three variables. So you can get like, for example, you know, like 45%. So that means that based on age, income level and education level, you can correctly predict uh, what kind of car the people buy 45% of the time, or rather, I guess it gives you the statistics above the, uh, the chance. So like if you have three different types of cars, by chance it would be 33, 33, 33%. But here you will be more accurate than chance so many times. And if you achieve accuracy of 100%, then, you know, with these characteristics, it would mean that you can precisely predict, you know, you just look at the person's profile and you can tell right away what kind of car this person will buy. So, or the other way around. So, um, um, yeah, but, but that's the idea. So here you deal with the groups and you either find to uh, try to find so-called latent groups. So uh, you don't know what the groups are but you run the analysis and it gives you some sort of groups and then the characteristics, or you know what the groups are and you're trying to explain why some people end up in this group or how this group is different from that group. So you can have the group, uh, like for discriminant analysis, you know the groups for uh, latent class analysis or cluster analysis, you don't know what those groups are, how many of them exist. So you sort of look for those uh, ways to separate the sample into ways that uh, you will have the maximum similarity within the group and maximum differences among the groups. And now, Haas, is this, is this different than structural equation modeling? I mean, isn't this what uh, a step one for a structural equation model? 
Um, well, structural equation modeling is basically your OLS regression in a sense, right? I mean, it's, it's more complicated, but it deals with, it, it uses the same math as structural equation uh, as OLS regression. So your variables presumably would be, uh, you know, continuous, normally distributed. You, you can use Danis, but it would be, uh, you know, uh, more like zero one. So here you can have many groups and this one is more of a exploratory. So uh, structural equation modeling, you have your A affects B and here, and you test uh, what is the strength of the effect? Is the, is the relationship significant? Here it's a little bit different. Here you like, for example, latent class analysis and um, um, uh, cluster analysis. You are trying to explore what those groups are. So you kind of almost have, it's not really that you have one variable, but you say, okay, I know these 10 characteristics of these people. So how many distinct groups will emerge in this sample? And so the answer can be, you know, maybe there are two groups, you know, old and young, and they old, educated, rich, young, poor, uneducated, for example. Or it can have, you know, it, it may be, there may be five groups. So maybe group one are educated, rich, group two are uneducated, rich, but young. So there could be, so I think it's a very, very different sort of purpose. I guess the actual math may not be that different. But, but yeah, when, when you deal with cluster analysis and similar techniques, it's either you're trying to predict how many groups exist or explore how many groups exist or are trying to predict who's going to be in which group or you are trying to see if the groups are different on which of the sort of dimensions. So it's more kind of dealing with those group memberships. And again, it's nominal, it's, it's not continuous, it's just groups. So, and then obviously the statistics will tell, you know, to what extent the group, groups are different, what percent of variance is within the groups versus between the groups. So you'll have all kinds of different statistics that are very different from those that you get from regression or um, a structural equation modeling where you just have the beta coefficients that show you essentially one unit change and this leads to so many unit changes in that one. So it's not a causal model. It's not really so much causality. It's more group membership, which is a little bit different. But, but yeah, ultimately, I guess, if you look kind of under the hood, I will not be surprised that the math is still somewhat similar. It just, um, you know, kind of for different purposes. If that makes sense. You know, I have a question. Mm -hmm. could, that be, could that be used to try to dissect so it's an after the fact, but you look at these work groups, some are successful, some are not, or some are, you know, achieve and create something really um, spectacular. Can this be a way that you can just kind of dissect those groups to say, okay, it looks like when you bring these types of individuals together with these traits that the outcomes seem to have a higher, like they have a higher probability of succeeding or, you know what I'm saying? Like, if it comes to succeeding again, depending on how you define success, but if it's less, you know, succeeding in terms of either success, no success, one or zero, then mm -hmm. it would be better to just, you know, logistic regression will work better. Or if success is defined as, you know, number of units make, made or, or quality of the unit, you know, from zero to 100, you know, then probably the regression will do fine. Here it's, you know, like for example, again, Karen, to what you do, let's say for example, you manage a coaching program and you get, I don't know, 50 requests for help every day. And so you know who the people are who ask for help. So you know their age, education, nationality, uh, university, all kinds of things. And so you're trying to see other distinct types of sort of people who ask for help. And so maybe there are several different types and maybe you can assign your coaches to specialize, you know, you deal, you cater to this group of people, you cater to this group of people because they have distinct characteristics and needs. And so you run your cluster analysis and sure enough, you have several distinct sort of types of people asking for help. So type one, for example, they have conflicts in teams. And so that's the kind of request they make. And these are the characteristics of that group. And another group, they seek feedback. So they have their different characteristics. They ask, so basically they, they would be different in terms of what kind of help they need and what the characteristics are. And especially it would be useful if let's say, you know, for example, like discriminant analysis. So you know who asks for what kind of help but you wanna know what are the differences among those groups in terms of demographics, for example. Or, or as I said, you don't know how many different distinct types are there. And so you're trying to group them in, term, in terms of those variables. So it's more, again, dealing more with groups as opposed to, or predicting group mm -hmm. membership, as opposed to predicting success per se. I, I guess, you know, if you have success as, as membership, as, you know, as I said, successful, not successful, yeah. or maybe so success. But just going with your idea. Yeah, I think it's great to help create a persona for who are the types yeah, yeah. of personas would be, yeah, yeah. Th this is a new term I, I haven't heard it like up until about two years ago but yeah in marketing now there is something called persona so like when you design your marketing campaign or or it could be you know call center or it could be like you know um, help center or maybe 
let's say there is an on-campus unit uh, that deals with a student, um, uh, basically, you know, trying to help students with whatever problems they have, uh, some sort of, you know, like hotline. And so you're trying to sort of decide or figure out what kind of personas or types of students you're serving or what kinds of customers you're serving. And you don't know how many of those personas exist. Maybe there are only two or maybe there are 25 and you're not sure what the characteristics of each are. So you run cluster analysis here or latent class analysis, for example. And as I said, uh, it will give you the answer that is not hypothesized a priori. So you don't know what, how many personas are and what characteristics are there. You just give the characteristics, all the data that you have, and you may specify the dependent variable, like for example, you know, number of times the person asks for help or type of request the person has or not. And so if you do have that specific, you know, outcome variable, so to speak, or characteristic that would be led in class analysis, for cluster analysis, you don't even have that. And so, and then, yeah, whatever the number emerges. And in fact, one of the problems with this method, I'll be honest with you, I re uh, rejected a paper not so long ago that used this technique. So they wanted to see if there are sort of cultural clusters as they called it. And so they ran latent class analysis. So they were looking at uh, basically dumped all kinds of um, uh, uh, data uh, from a value survey mod uh, from world value survey. And um, so they, they basically were trying to see are there any clusters that are more meaningful than countries. And so I love the topic. I wrote a paper myself on whether or not country is equal to culture. So can we talk about German culture versus American culture versus, versus Japanese culture? So, uh, you know, the, the question is very good. And so they ran latent class analysis and they found clusters like, you know, like, uh, I think they found like 12 clusters in the United States and eight clusters in China. And they said, no, culture is not a very good, you know, culture is not, a, I mean, country is not a very good container for culture because there are all those different clusters even within countries. The problem I had with the paper was that those clusters were, they almost looked random to me. Like, you know, so how are they different? Well, this one is a little higher on this variable, a little lower on that variable, and we have so many variables. And I didn't really see those clusters as distinct and meaningful. Like when we talked about the car buyers here, right? So when I say soccer mom, I know what that profile looks like. You know, as I said, like, I know that it's a female. I know that it's probably unemployed or maybe stay home mom I, or, or maybe working mom that has kids. So it gives me some logical, you know, explanation. And in the paper that I read, uh, they didn't go as far as identify, you know, like labeling those, those clusters and giving me some logical explanations of what they are. They just said, we had those whatever 15 or 20 variables. And so for cluster one, variable one is within this range, variable two is within this range. And it almost looked random to me. And that's the threat. Sometimes you can get this kind of, you know, mix like a salad of, of characteristics. And so you sort of realize that, yeah, they, they seem to be different from one another, but are they sort of different in a meaningful way? Can I sort of say, okay, oh, I know what kind of person this is. You know, that's the kind of person who. So sometimes it would be almost like random and, and, and difficult to work with. Uh, so. Do you think that's a function of not having enough data? It could be not enough data, or perhaps it could be that maybe those groups are not that distinct after all. Like again, when we talk about cars, I suppose there is a very different, big difference among those people who buy, let's say, a pickup truck versus those who buy a minivan. So mm -hmm. I mean, I imagine that there is a you know like legitimate difference in all kinds of characteristics among those people. They buy them for different needs. But when you look, for example, at what kind of computer people buy. I'm sure the cluster analysis will still give you some sort of, you know, data, but I mean, will those differences be that meaningful or are those people really that different? So you would then sort of run the discriminant analysis and see, okay, people who buy Dell versus, I don't know, HP, and you may find that there is really no systemic difference. I mean, it seems random. Although when you look at maybe Apple versus, you know, Dell, maybe there will be something more to it. So, so therefore, sometimes it would be very meaningful and you look at those characteristics and you'll say, oh my gosh, yeah, that makes sense. So this one is definitely like my friend Bob and this one is definitely like my mother. And so that makes sense. But sometimes you kind of look at it and, and those variations seem to be almost arbitrary or random and uh, even though they may be statistically significant. So this one is a little trickier in that respect. Or as I said, maybe it will just show you that all the customers are alike and there is really no, no segments per se. So, uh, or at least no distinct segments. So, um, all right. So, any 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 thoughts about how you can do this group membership, uh, you know, type of analysis for your for your study? I mean, obviously, all of your business students. So, I guess market segmentation would be the obvious, uh, you know, suggestion. 
but anything else other than segmenting your either employees or uh, customers? I'm going to use it to uh, segment board members. I mean, all of the board member data is in, in the University of Pennsylvania data set, Wharton, and it's it's basically gives you everything about them. I mean, I just was research, researching for the project we just did. They've added uh, in the last year and a half, they added sexual orientation. I have no mm -hmm. idea how they get all of this on board members, but they, they know everything about board members there. I mean, I, I'm surprised they don't have blood type in there. Hmm, interesting. And actually, they have that for yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to ask if they have that for top management too, because I, you know, they, I, do. they have it for all director level. So director level, I think the challenge though, Susan is I played around a little bit with that to top management. They, it's, if some companies may consider a top management, it's, it's, it's self-selected by the company. What's considered a director at the top. Mm, yeah. So Joe, let's say, you know, your results turn out perfectly, just like you expected. Can you think of distinct sort of types of board members, uh, you know, with multiple characteristics? Like, you know, what would be, because to me, what comes to mind, you know, maybe one type sort of self-made, you know, company founders and so board members because of, of that. Maybe another one, I don't know. Uh, uh, Technology or, tycoon. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I, yeah I, I do have some personas that I've been thinking that they are, yeah. um, you know, there's some of them, I mean, that are like a political powerhouses. Yeah, well, political or, power, yeah. Yeah, kind of you get it on the, get them on the board just because of the name and the cloud they bring and prestige, yeah. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe some sort of a, like a diversity quota or something, or mm -hmm. maybe the board looks around and realizes that, oh, you know, it's all white male, you know, 40 something. So that's not good. You know, we read the studies that it's better to have a diverse board, which actually many studies do show you, you have more variety of ideas, the company performs better. And so maybe all of a sudden they're frantically looking for someone who is different from that main profile. So, yeah. But yeah, so we don't know what those, what those results will come out, but yeah, I guess you can find something like that, that maybe there are distinct, or maybe, you know, you look also at the performance data and the voting, and then you will realize, okay, these are the people who vote, you know, for like pure profit motivated. And these people, they make, you know, they vote more like social responsibility, perhaps. And so then you will find, so how are they different? And you will realize that maybe those high tech tycoons, maybe they always worry only about the, you know, market growth. Whereas maybe some other ones, they actually care about the environment more, or whatever the decision the company makes. So, yeah, that's a very good example. All right, so we're running out of time. Let's do one more last method. And then um, uh, if we have any other questions. So, so profile analysis. This one is very, very simple. Uh, so kind of related to group membership, but um, essentially let's say you want to know if, if the profile of one group versus the other is different. And in that respect, it's similar to discriminant fu function analysis. But essentially what it does, it, it will plot, let's say these are the characteristics that you look at. And so you will have, let's say in this case, you have four groups and it gives you the profile of each group with sort of the mean on each of the dimensions. And so looking at this chart, you see right away that, for example, this red group, uh, unhealthy students, whatever that is, uh, they are different from, for example, group uh, green group, which is healthy students, right? So clearly there is a difference, but the question is, is it statistically significant? So uh, is there something, you know, basically you wanna test the difference and you wanna see what it is. And so this one is just a, a more fancier method than just looking at the group averages and trying to understand is there a difference or not? And so it becomes especially useful when you have a lot of characteristics because, you know, looking at this, let's say, for example, green versus blue. So it seems like they're not really that different on the first five characteristics, but more different on the last five. And so again, it will allow you to test if you can claim that the two groups are different uh, without making the type one error. So basically it will give you the statistical significance of your claim and uh, things like that. And so uh, it's kind of simple, but it gives you some additional useful, um, useful uh, statistics. And a different one, again, very simple, but I wanted to include it is uh, that's the multi-way frequency analysis. Again, so for example, let's see if, you know, some political affiliation uh, predicts uh, the type of profession people choose. So you have, let's say, for example, political affiliation as Republican, Democrat, or a libertarian and the professions as business owner, scientist, or artist, or hired employee. And you wanna know if there is a correlation between these variables. Uh, technically, you could look at, you know, well, I, I don't think you can use correlations because your variables could be all nominal. Like in this case, political affiliation, it's a nominal category. Uh, profession is a nominal category. So, but what you would do is you would produce a frequency table, something like this, 
And so you would look at, for example, you would say, for example, okay, 25% of Republicans are hired employees, and then 35% of Democrats are hired employees, and then, you know, so many percent of libertarians are hired employees. And so you would have those numbers. And as long as they're different, just looking at that kind of count table, frequency table, you would see if there is a difference. But then again, the question becomes, but is it statistically significant? And what if it's different for one group, but not the other? So you want to have a more sophisticated uh, sort of, you know, uh, type of output and conclusion. And so multi-way frequency analysis sort of allows you to essentially test the significance of those simple frequency comparisons. Again, uh, if you have non-normal, non-continuous, non-normally distributed variables, you have all these frequencies. And that's where it becomes a little bit complicated. And so you just use multi-way frequency analysis. Very simple technique, nothing, nothing difficult, but it gives you that scientific rigor to just simply saying that, uh, for example, political affiliation correlates with, you know, profession because there are more business owners among Republicans than among Democrats. And so I will then ask, but is the difference significant? And you'll say, well, 25% versus 28%. But I'll say, so is it significant or not? And then you'll say, well, I'm not sure. Well, multi-wide frequency analysis will give you those statistics, will give you nice, uh, you know, uh, sort of, you know, p-values and then all kinds of additional outputs. So it gives you a little bit more information. Uh, so that's all I wanted to cover so far. So I'm not sure if there are any other questions that you may have. Uh, for your homework, as I said, you need to select one, any one of today's methods and write a, uh, again, a proposal uh, for that method. And we don't need to get into too much details as to how exactly you will test it. I mean, unless you have the data and you want to do it, or maybe, you know, just describe in great detail. But for me, it's important that you sort of think that there is or realize that there are more methods than just the regression and the correlation and the, I don't know, t-test. And then uh, that you think that sometimes you have more types of questions you can answer than just simply does A affect B. So if you have, a, as I said, like 500 repeated measures every day. So obviously A affect B is not enough because you want to see how long, at which stage there is a difference, at which stage there is no difference. And then you're like, oh, there is time series analysis. I can use it. Or uh, if you're looking at uh, the outcome, you know, uh, yes or no, uh, get the job or not get the job, you realize, okay, well, I could use the regression, but regression is designed for continuous normally distributed dependent variables. And here it's clearly a binary variable. So it would have to be logic. And so you basically say, okay, in my case, I would use the logic. So that, that's the important thing. On your comprehensive exams, you will have questions like that. So again, we will not ask you to run the test per se, but you definitely will be asked to design a study and uh, so there will be either a scenario where you have one of these non-normal variables and you will need to say, oh, wait a second, it actually would have to be survival analysis or it would have to be logistic regression or it would have to be whatever that is. Or vice versa, we will say, why don't you design a study? And so you, you have, you know, this is the scenario in general, but how would you test it? And so that's where you would think about it. And we would not expect from you, you know, being super proficient in each method. But it's important that you recognize that uh, OLS regression has a bunch of assumptions. And if they are violated, uh, or if the variables are completely of different type, it wouldn't work that way. So you would need to use a specific different method. All right, so any questions, any comments? So we have a very interesting lecture next one. Um, in fact, probably my favorite. So we will talk about interesting cases um, where everything seems to be almost correct and the reviewer is still not happy. Like for example, what, what are the things that reviewers may ask you to do? Like for example, uh, one of the debates that we will discuss is um, um, uh, significance testing versus effect size. They will say, okay, well, your p-value is less than 0 0.05, but what is your effect size? And so this is a fascinating topic, uh, nothing complicated, but you know, uh, significant, statistical significance is not very interpretable, so, so to say, so in practical terms. And so we'll talk about those kinds of things or maybe some of the biases that sometimes we see in the, in the data. And so it seems like you did everything right, but the reviewer will say, wait, wait a second. So why, why might it not work? Like for example, I got into an argument today, uh, we talked about the effects of um, minimum wage. So when you um, impose a minimum wage, uh, is it, uh, does, it, does it hurt employment or not? Do more people get jobs or fewer people get jobs? Like for example, if the federal uh, minimum wage went up to $15, would it lead to fewer people having jobs or not necessarily? And so this, the person I was arguing with um, cited a study that um, 
looked, uh, basically did a survey, so they knew that a state will be implementing the minimum wage uh, requirement. And so they surveyed uh, something like a thousand companies in that city, uh, asking them how many on average employees the company has. And then when the new minimum wage went into the effect, uh, six months later, they again found a sample of a thousand companies in that same city, different companies, but you know, in the same location. And they called them again and said, how many employees do you have now? And they found that on average in both cases before the, the minimum wage requirement and after, there were on average about 51 point something like three people working for the company from which they conclude, well, the average number of employees per company didn't change in the same location. So therefore minimum wage has no effect on employment numbers. And so uh, it's a, it's a, there is a threat to validity of that finding. It's not necessarily that it's wrong, but it's not conclusive. Can you think why it is not? Why it may not be an accurate uh, conclusion? Well, I mean, I mean, I think it depends on the city, right? So if I think of Raleigh, for example, of, I don't know what the, the year difference between the the time difference between the study was, but Raleigh's growing so rapidly that even though you might not see a change in employment, um, it may just be that the, the city is doing better and more people are spending money. And so it, it well, here I'll give you the same might not change. Possibly, possibly. I mean, there could be many threats, but uh, the obvious one is the so called survivor bias. So let's say, for example, I want to study not if uh, increasing the minimum wage uh, kills jobs, but I want to see if playing Russian roulette um, is, is killing people. And so I find 100 people who played Russian roulette. And so 100 people, or let's say, you know, I know there, there are 1,000 people who played Russian roulette. And so I send a letter to all 1,000, and let's say 500 of them reply and take part in my survey. And so the, the survey had only one question. So do you think Russian roulette is dangerous? So did it kill you? And all 500 people who participated in my survey said, no, it didn't kill me. So I make a conclusion, yeah, it, it's a safe game. Everybody who participated in my survey said that they survived. So, but it's an obvious flawed, you know, survey design because some people perhaps didn't survive but they couldn't take part in my study. Same thing, so with the minimum wage, what if many companies went out of business? What if many, let's say, restaurants uh, were hiring teenagers for $5 an hour, but now that there is a minimum wage of $15, uh, they cannot afford those teenagers, but without that, you know, cheap teenagers, they cannot stay in business. So they go out of business, but, you know, when I do my survey wave two, uh, they, they're not in the sample. I only reach those who are still in business, and so maybe there is, so it doesn't, it's not that uh, minimum wage if affects or does not affect the employment, it's just there is a threat to validity of those, those findings. So it, it's, I cannot make the conclusion unless it's the same sample and I track how many you know, companies from that sample may be dropped out. And so we'll talk about some interesting things like that, that again, immediately it may not seem you know, relevant uh, or may not you know, come to your mind, but when you think about it, like, oh yeah, actually that, you know, it's almost like I was making a joke in one of my classes, I think with you guys, I was saying, so if you're absent today, please raise your hand. So no raised hands, oh, okay, good, everybody's present then. So obviously, again, uh, it seems like a good method. We did a survey, we had a 100% response rate, uh, at least those who were present all participated, nobody raised their hand, but you know, obviously I cannot make the conclusion that nobody's absent. So we'll talk about things like that, and so hopefully it will save you some hassle when you are dealing with reviewers, because sometimes they may ask questions that you didn't expect. And then the last lecture that we will have, um, uh, we will uh, look at some tricks and tips on how to design surveys online. So again, I'd like to believe that I'm quite proficient with it, and I do some things that at least most of my colleagues don't know how to do. And so it's relatively simple to learn. I mean, it's as long as you know that that function is available, you can use it. The problem is that many people don't even realize that they can do things like that. And so um, I'll show you some very, very useful things, like extremely useful. I mean, I assume all of you will be doing online survey or online surveys online. And uh, I'll, I'll show you some of the functionality that now is standard pretty much in all programs that most people don't even know that it's available. So interesting stuff. All right, good night. So talk to you, I guess, in two weeks. Uh, and so your next assignment, which is due, I think, two weeks from now, uh, one of the methods today, uh, choose anyone and describe, basically come up with a research question and a hypothesis for this kind of question. And then if the data are a little different, then describe what kind of data you would use for each of the variables. Okay, good night. Thank you so much, guys. Stay in touch. And as Thank always, you. As, as always the closer you get your proposal to the actual dissertation, 
the more I can help you. And I've sat down already with a few students and we'll look kind of deeper and try. So ideally, it doesn't have to be, you can still get an A plus, no problem. But ideally, the outcome of this project, of this course will be that you have a very, you know, neat, detailed research design for your actual dissertation. Again, if you don't, no problem, we can connect always later. So I'm here and uh, we can keep working together even if, you know, the course is over. But the goal of this course is that you kind of develop a good idea as to what method you will use for your dissertation. Good night. Bye-bye. Night, everybody. Bye-bye.